journey. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Kevin Gover. Kevin is director of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American Indian, and he is a member of the Pawnee and Comanche tribes. Prior to his time at the National Museum, Kevin was a professor at the great Arizona State University. Thank you. Uh, served as Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs from 1997 to 2000 and practiced law in Albuquerque, New Mexico for more than 15 years. We have invited Kevin to join us this morning in sharing his vision for the future of our trust relationship. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Gover. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jackie and President Keel as well for giving me this opportunity. I'm really happy and grateful to be here with all of you. Uh, while they're working on pulling up my PowerPoint, let me just um, uh, sort of start in on, you do have my PowerPoint, right? Okay. Okay. Let me just emphasize what um, uh, Dr. Brown was. Nope. Uh, Go back. Sorry. Tiffany, oh, they're, they're pointing one. There we go. Thank you. Um, what Dr. Brown was talking about, about creating our, our own future. Uh, from where I sit at the National Museum, now that I'm no longer sort of in, uh, as deeply involved in the day-to-day -day fray, and, uh, but it's, it's good to come here and, and listen again and learn about uh, the specifics of the issues that are, that are confronting you. But from where, where I sit, I have the luxury of being able to take uh, a longer view. Um, and one of the things uh, I want to share with you, a couple of things that I've been thinking about. Uh, specifically, Jackie asked me to talk about the, the future of the trust relationship, and I think we have to do that by looking first at where this relationship comes from. While we all use the phrase regularly, uh, usually we haven't really thought about the origins of this idea. Uh, in fact, the origins of the trust are, are pretty negative. Uh, there were a series of statutory disabilities that were forced on the tribes. Uh, they, weren't, uh, they weren't enacted for the benefit of the tribes. They were enacted for the benefit of the United States and at the expense of the tribes. You notice in the, in the uh, trust statutes in general, there are very few affirmative obligations that the United States has. There's no rule that they have to make the most of your property. Rather, it's phrased in terms of what you cannot do without the approval of the United States. And of course, as we've all learned, uh, often there are few, if any, consequences for an actual breach of the trust. Um, these all find expression in some of the fundamental ideas underlying federal Indian law. First, that Indian property rights are inferior to non-Indian title. That was one of the uh, earliest Supreme Court decisions about Indians was that Indian title was not the same as the kind of title that non-Indians uh, acquired and held. A second underlying premise of our current trust relationship is that Indians are incompetent, they are dependent on the United States, and they require protection. And this, is, this idea is over 130 years old. It emerged out of the idea, which is also 130, 40, 50 years old, that Indian tribes are going to disappear. And that was really the whole point of the General Allotment Act. Is it any surprise that the implementation of such a bad idea would get irreparably screwed up over the coming hundred years? And that's what we saw. That's what led to the Cobell litigation. And then finally, this idea of a trust, this idea that the United States unilaterally gets to decide the nature of the relationship with the tribes, finds expression in this idea of plenary power, that the United States has total authority over Indian property. Well, that's not a trust at all. Uh, who would negotiate for that arrangement where you get to decide everything about what I do with my property? And yet that is the trust that we've inherited uh, from, from, this, from this history. What I think we, we should start to think about, and, and this is not a short-term project, this is a project that uh, should start immediately, but that's going to take a long time to develop and implement, and frankly I think 
that uh, the first part of the conversation is among ourselves, where we begin to think about what do we want this trust relationship to look like. First, obviously, uh, and given the, the conditions that we find ourselves in, we have to separate individual lands from tribal lands. Despite all the attention the Cobell litigation received, the fact remains that 90% of native trust land is actually tribal trust land. It's not individual. And so the, the uh, implementation or the, the reform and management of the individual allotment policy sort of sucks all the oxygen out of the room when the more important asset is the, is the tribal trust asset. Second, uh, if we are in a negotiation situation, then the United States is automatically honoring the tribe's authority to protect its own interest. Third, a third element is that we have to construct, construct a true trust, not, not sort of a, a fantasy one where one side imposes all of, all of the rules, but instead one that reflects uh, actual tribal circumstances and aspirations in this day and age, that gets rid of all those racist assumptions about Indian inferiority and Indian dependency. Uh, next, they have to be specific to the tribe itself. Uh, a one-size-fits-all trust responsibility when it comes to the management of these assets just doesn't work because the tribes are so very different, their circumstances are so very different, their land is so very different that trying to administer them all with the same set of rules, it was crazy uh, from the beginning and once again uh, produced the results uh, that, that we're living with today. And then finally, there have to be real consequences for a breach. Um, we all know that it's extraordinarily difficult to, uh, to get relief from the United States for a, brief of the trust, uh, for a breach of the trust, and uh, that just shouldn't be so. If you've got a trustee, the trustee has to be very specifically and broadly uh, responsible for outcomes, and if they fail to achieve proper outcomes, then there should be consequences. Now, unfortunately, a lot of this kind of stuff could come up before this National Commission on Indian Trust Administration and Reform. And this is the commission that was established as part of the Cobell settlement. Um, the, uh, and, and it is, by the way, charged with a comprehensive evaluation of the management and administration of the trust. But there are two problems. First, it's probably, and I, I was looking at it over the last few days, and, and specifically at the secretarial order that led to the establishment of this commission, uh, it seems to be limited to administration of the individual trust. And as I just said, the much larger asset is the tribal trust. And so it's not going to get to some of the, the, the most important issues that are out there. Second, it just seems to me that once again, we get caught in the business of tinkering with the mechanics of the implementation, the administration, the management of the trust, but not the philosophical problems that underlie the entirety of the trust. And so the commission's not probably a way we're gonna get there. Uh, now that doesn't mean this stuff isn't important. It doesn't mean the work of the commission isn't important and we have to participate aggressively um, in, what that, in what that commission's work is, but it's not gonna get us where we need to be. Um, a second thing I've been thinking about is this. This is a, a picture, a photograph, taken at the Vatican uh, just a few days ago where they were celebrating the canonization of the first Native American saint. And uh, one of the things that we see is this nun, uh, in quote, dressing up as an Indian. Similarly, just in the last couple of weeks, we saw the Gap uh, retailer come under fire for marketing this shirt with Manifest Destiny on it. And um, that's, uh, uh, you know, Manifest Destiny has, has a pretty weighty meaning to us. It meant nothing to the gap. And when they, when they came under attack, to their credit, they backed up away from it and said, oh, we, we didn't know. And, and so they've stopped marketing it. But we have to realize that, that for them to even form that idea tells you a lot about sort of where the, where the American and frankly the world psyche is about who Indians are and what it is that we do. Um, now the sister and the designers of this Gap t-shirt they're not racist. They're acting on what they have been taught by the formal education system and by the popular culture, uh, particularly here in the United States and including these dreadful sports mascots. We have to change what people are taught about Indians. And it really matters. 
because if you look at who makes decisions in Indian policy today, members of the Supreme Court, other federal judges, members of Congress, even members of the administration, those decision makers had their attitudes formed by incomplete and erroneous information they received in the formal education system and from the popular culture. Even worse, tomorrow's decision makers are having their attitudes shaped in the same way and by the same kind of material. So let me tell you what the museum's going to do for the next four years. First, we're going to have an exhibition about treaties. This will come on in 2014. And we will talk about three themes. First, that treaties were and are serious diplomacy. Second, that treaty principles were betrayed to the enormous disadvantage of the tribes. But third, that we are nothing if not persistent. I was going to say, if you, uh, if you don't like what I say, my name is Joe Garcia, actually. <laughs> Um, and so we want to bring that treaty relationship, and, and as uh, one of the speakers was saying earlier, it's still alive, it's still real. And the way we know that is the President of the United States is sitting down and meeting with tribal leaders about the issues that concern them. Now, the other thing we're going to do at the museum is change out the three permanent galleries. Earlier this year, I, I received a delegation of tribal leaders who had some very important things to say to me, saying that what they want to see is this museum tell the real story about the history of Native Americans in the Americas. So we have been working on three exhibitions that we hope very much you're going to like. The first we want to call Ancestors. One of the great myths that is so destructive to us is that the Americas were a wilderness. They were not. They were fully occupied. Indian people were engaged from the tip of Tierra del Fuego to the Arctic Circle, as we all know. And they had many achievements. For example, on the Mississippi River, there was a city called, no, it wasn't called Cahokia, but they've come to call it Cahokia now. It was a city um, of, uh, that was, in 1100, larger than the city of London was at the time. The city of London was the largest city in England. Of course, we all know about the Inca Empire, but not in the kind of detail that we're going to present it to say there may have been as many as 10 million people living in the Sacred Valley in the Andes that were the subjects of the Inca Empire. Native people had enormous knowledge. They formed star charts like this one that is as accurate as any star map that's being produced by the modern computers. And we had achievements in political science and political theory, such as the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So we're going to come out and say they, this world developed entirely independently of Europe, Africa, and Asia, and these are genuine human achievements. The second gallery we're going to call Contact. And uh, obviously, it begins with the encounter between Native people and the Europeans. The most important idea here is this idea of a Colombian exchange, that the achievements, the products, the wealth, the labor of Native people change the course of the world. We've been written out of world history as bit players, but we were not. We were extraordinarily important, and the things that our ancestors achieved changed the world forever. And of course, they changed us. And so the second part of the contact story is the biological catastrophe that befell the tribes. If it weren't for this little bugger, a smallpox germ, history would have been very, very, very different. But we have to account for what happened. The final exhibition will be called Americans. And here we're going to take on these stereotypes and say, all the stories you've heard, all the things you think you know are just a little bit true, but you need to know more. And so when we'll talk about Thanksgiving, because our visitors want to hear about Thanksgiving, but we'll then point out that within a generation, Metacomet's War took place and virtually wiped out a number of the New England tribes and crippled the remaining. We will talk about Pocahontas and uh, how, in fact, Pocahontas did not save John Smith. John Smith made that up to sell books. But more importantly, what they don't know about is the Pueblo Revolt and how the Indians actually drove the, the uh, Spanish out of New Mexico at one point. Why don't they know this story? I think it's because the Indians won, and that doesn't fit in the great American narrative. <laughs> Everybody's heard of Little Bighorn and all of the Plains warfare, but what they don't know about is the genocide in California. 
And these stories are foundational to American history, and yet Americans don't know the story. And what we want visitors to think when they leave these galleries is two things. One, we want to hear them say, I didn't know that, because we know that they don't know these things. And the second thing we want to hear them saying is, I wonder why I didn't know that. Why were these things left out of my formal education? What does it serve for, uh, for, for this ignorance to be propounded? And most importantly, how does it disadvantage modern Native people that this tru these truths are not known? We're not being radical. We're not making up stuff. This is mainstream scholarship these days, but it's still not making its way into the popular consciousness, and that's what we're out to change. So with your help, with your support, uh, with your ideas, we can change what's being taught in the schools. We can change what Americans and the rest of the world are being taught, and, uh, and I believe deep in my heart that that's going to make things better for us. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, come to the museum. <laughs>